Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm here to introduce Dr. Dimitri Christakis, who is joining us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Dimitri's lab focuses on the effects of early environmental influences on child health. He speaks frequently about the impact of early learning on brain development. He is the co-author of The Elephant in the Living Room, Make Television Work for Your Kids, and his work has been featured on TV, radio, and in newspa newspapers worldwide. Dimitri is the George Atkins Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Washington, the Director of the Center for Child Health, Behavior and Development at Seattle Children's Research Institute, and an attending physician at Seattle Children's Hospital. Please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, as Amy said, I'm a, I'm a pediatrician, a researcher, and a parent, and I became those things in that order. And the reason the sequencing is important is because even though I was a pediatrician who took care of children for quite a while and a researcher who studied ways to keep them healthy, it wasn't until I became a parent about 15 years ago that I became interested in, some might even say obsessed with, our early learning and early brain development. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the effects of a technologized infancy, and I'm a little bit worried about talking about uh, some of the negative effects of technology, particularly on early brain development to this, to this crowd. But uh, it's not all bad. In fact, I anticipate in some of your questions that it will, will focus on some of the positive aspects of it. So uh, William Wordsworth said, uh, the child is the father of the man at the, at the start of the 20th century. And I think for those of us that are parents or those of us that think about children, take care of children, uh, many of us believe that, that, that early childhood is really critical to, to who we become as, as adults. Now, media figure very large in the, in the lives of American families. And as it says here, I don't know, honey, what do you feel like doing tonight? And you might ask me, given how large a footprint television and other media leave in children's lives today, what we did in the days before television and of course, it was this. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit um, about how we got to where we are, uh, focusing initially on television, which was, of course, the first, uh, the first visual medium uh, that most of us grew up with, from what I call the promotional period to mass market. And you'll see here an ad, actually an early ad for Motorola, talking about how television benefits your children. Um, and you also might notice in this dated uh, pro dated ad what these children are watching, and they're watching Howdy Doody. Now, the reason that programming is important uh, has a lot to do with how television started. So it, it was invented, as many of you probably know, in 1950, during what I call the promotional period of the media itself. And in 1950, there were 85 children's programs on per week. These were, uh, about half of them had no advertising at all. And these were high-quality, family-centered fare. Um, most of you are too young to have watched these shows when they first aired, but I suspect almost all of you recognize at least some of these because they are part of American lore. In those days, families had a single television. It was centrally located, and they watched these programs together, uh, very different from the way most children today engage with media. The typical family has two to three televisions in their home. In fact, there are more televisions globally than there are toilets. Um, and 30% of preschool children have TVs in their bedrooms. 80% of teenagers have preschool children and have, have televisions in their bedrooms. 100% of preschool children have preschoolers in their bedroom. Um, and and uh, increasingly, families don't watch together. They, they're pulled apart and watch independently. Now, um, I should point out that, that uh, the uptake of television was truly remarkable. So in 1950, it was invented. By 1956, 75% of households had, had television. It's an incredible uptake of technology, particularly when you keep in mind how expensive televisions were back then, not the way they are now. Uh, and yet, the majority of households invested significantly into acquiring those. 
And once that happened, the prevailing market forces switched from trying to sell televisions to trying to sell advertising. And when you try to sell advertising, young children aren't your preferred demographic then and now. Uh, it's really people 18 to 49. And what, what resulted was a, a dramatic decrease in primetime shows uh, for children. And the 1960s gave rise to something I remember very well from my childhood, which was Saturday morning cartoons. The idea being put children's programming, low quality I should point out, low budget children's programming into a morning slot when grown-ups aren't watching, where they get to stay in the rack for longer. Um, and by 1970, 75% of all children's programming was on weekends. Well, that, of course, is ancient history by today's standards because, as you know, we have 24-7 programming for children today, multiple different platforms, multiple locations. You can pretty much watch TV everywhere. Walmart recently introduced televisions into shopping carts so that children can watch while their parents shop. And the most recent development is uh, little advertising uh, gizmos on shelves by products trying to sell specifically uh, in this case, to children, in many cases, to children. So this says, go to your chat room. The uh, effect of all of this is that we are technologizing childhood in a way that's really unprecedented. In 1970, uh, the average age at which children began to watch television was four years, like this cute little girl there. And today, based on research that we've done, it's about four months. So there's been a dramatic shift in the age at which children begin to interact with these media. And it's not just the age uh, that's at least potentially concerning, it's the amount of time that they spend. So you can see from this graphic here that children zero to six spend about two hours a day, and children eight to 18 spend about five and a half hours a day. Don't ask me how much time seven-year-olds spend. I didn't collect these data. I don't know why they were excluded from the collection. But um, the two hours a day that these young children watch, that's based these data were collected based on home viewing. And we did a study a little while ago to figure out about viewing in childcare settings. And what we found was that, as you can see here, the children in home-based programs, where about half children in the United States are taken care of, watch an additional hour and 20 minutes a day. Uh, whereas children in, 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 in institutional daycares don't actually watch that uh, much additional. But the typical preschool child today watches between four and five hours of television a day. They're only awake for about 10 to 12 hours a day. So do the math. They're spending close to 40% of their waking hours in front of a TV screen. Now, why does this matter? Why should we care about how young children spend their time? Well, this is a typical newborn brain. And the typical newborn brain weighs about 333 grams. And it triples in weight in the first two years of life. Uh, it's an extraordinary period of brain growth. In fact, if you look at this graphic to show brain growth over the lifespan, you can see how dramatic the rise is very, very early in life, and that it peaks at about age 20. And I'll let you find yourselves uh, on the right there, and you, you can have some excuse for why you were unable to find your car keys this morning. But the point is not to talk about this end of the curve, but this end, just how steep it is um, early on. The truth is that um, we're born with our minds not fully formed. We're born with a mind that's highly adaptive to the world in which we inhabit. So we have a lifetime supply of neurons. That's the brain cells we're born with. But those brain cells form connections based on early experiences. So every, every single interaction, every experience a young infant has with his or her environment creates connections between those brain cells, fine-tuning the mind to a world that the child is living in. And to give you an example of how this plays out that you can all relate to, any child born anywhere in the world can learn to speak any language fluently. But if they're not exposed to certain sounds early in their life, they can learn to speak a second language later, but they will never sound like a native speaker. So a baby born today in mainland China, as amazing as it is, will learn to speak perfect Mandarin. But if she doesn't hear English sounds in the first few years of her life, she can learn to speak English later. But there's sounds she won't be able to make convincingly. We all know such people. Some of us are such people. Um, it's not because they weren't born with that capacity. Of course they were. It's because the mind early on decided, I, don't need, I live in a world where I don't need to roll my R's. And that, and that window closes. So it's an example you can all relate to. But it's true generally across the board. The mind adapts itself permanently to the world in which children live. 
So this graphic shows what I was talking about. We're born with a lifetime supply of neurons. They're shown here. And the connections between them, the synapses, typically at birth, there are about 1,500 synapses per neuron. By age 3, there are 25,000 synaptic connections per neuron. And by age 15, you'll see there's a diminishment. There's a gradual pruning of connect synaptic connections that aren't being reinforced in life. This, if you will, is a very, very crude graphic of how learning uh, and how the architecture of the mind is laid out early in life. Now what you see here is the breathing pattern of a one-day-old infant listening to music. And you can see here, these are the breaths, Mozart is being played, and then Stravinsky comes on, and then Mozart comes back on. Now I show this to you not to present some kind of an infantile critique of classical music, though some of you might have a theory about why Stravinsky does this to her breathing. Uh, I show it to you to demonstrate that there is a physiological response, a discernible physiological response from one day of life right out of the womb to what a child is hearing in her environment. That's how fine-tuned they are and these, this environment is affecting their brain development. Now we know from decades of research in humans and in animals that too little stimulation early in life is bad. I show you here two examples of PET scans. Now the way PET scans work is the brighter that they, they show brain activity. And the brighter areas, greater brain activity. Lighter areas, less brain activity. This is a PET scan of a normal kindergartner on your left. And on the right is a PET scan of a child who was raised in a horribly deprived environment. This is actually a PET scan of a kindergartner who was raised in a Romanian orphanage. Many of you may remember how these children were basically completely neglected uh, early in life, had virtually no stimulation, virtually no human contact. And you'll see that there are areas of this poor child's brain that are not active at all, that as a result of that profound lack of stimulation didn't develop. And obviously that has significant consequences for, for this child over their entire lifespan. So too little stimulation is bad. The question we've had in my lab for some time is what about too much? Is it possible to overstimulate the developing brain? or more appropriately, to inappropriately stimulate the developing brain, to condition it in ways that are fundamentally unhealthy for functioning in normal life. Which brings us to baby Einstein. Now, some of you may be familiar with baby Einstein DVDs, but uh, for those of you who are not, this is a brief clip from baby Einstein, baby McDonald, Day on the Farm. This is a 20-second clip from that uh, DVD, which is intended for infants, I should point out. So in that 20-second clip, there were seven scene changes, right? It's about the most exhausting day on the farm since John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. But, and there's, it's, it's difficult. Many adults find it kind of discombobulating, difficult to watch, because your mind is trying to make a coherent narrative out of this. And there is no coherent narrative to be made, right? This is completely random. Uh, but babies aren't trying to make a coherent narrative out of it. They're not cognitively capable of it. What's keeping them engaged in the screen is all of that scene change. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Here's a testimonial for Baby Einstein, a parental testimonial. The point is that there is so much education in this video, as well as interesting images. Some of the images are so interesting, they seem to hypnotize. Well, it's not exactly hypnosis, but keep in mind what this parent says as we talk for a second about the orienting response. And the orienting response was first described by Pavlov. You might know him from his dog experiments. Uh, but he also was the first to describe this reflex. It's a primitive reflex. We all have it. It's sometimes referred to as the what is it reflex. And the general idea is that we're all born with this primitive reflex that when you hear a strange sound or see a strange sight, your mind automatically shifts attention to that until it can be convinced that that doesn't pose a threat, right? It makes perfect sense. So you heard that clash. If you were distracted, you would look at the screen to see what is that. Uh, it's the same reason why 
every time you hear a car alarm or when you first heard a car alarm, you would, couldn't help but wheel around to see what it is. Now you can override the orienting reflex as you get older, so I suspect most of you now hear a car alarm and pay no attention to it. Um, but babies are born with this reflex without the capacity to override it. So sounds and sights that are strange to them will force their attention in that direction. And that is what's happening when they are watching something that has that much image change. That's exactly what's keeping them looking at the screen. They're not making sense of it. They're not trying to make sense of it. But at the same time, they can't look away. So the, the parent who said it's hypnotic, it's not hypnotic, but it does command attention in a way that is uh, unnatural. I want to talk a little bit, just briefly, about ADHD, which you're all familiar with. It currently affects about 10% of US children. And it's 10 times more common today than it was 20 years ago. Uh, some argue this is just increased recognition, uh, but it's probably both. It's probably increased recognition of an existing problem and a problem that has greater prevalence, similar uh, to what we're seeing with autism. Now, this, is, these, this graph shows the heritability. I've summarized 20, 30 studies here, the heritability of ADHD. And it clearly has a genetic component. If your parents have ADHD, you're at increased risk of having it yourself. But the heritability is only about 75%. So what does that mean? That means if you take two identical twins and one of them has ADHD, there's only a 75% chance that their sibling would. Right? Now, identical twins are genetically identical. So if it were completely genetic, it would be 100%. So there's something else going on. In most things today, we think of gene-environment interaction. So there's a lot of genes that have been identified as risk factors for ADHD. There's some environmental triggers. Those come together and produce what we think of as a child that has attentional problems. The Surgeon General himself in 1999 said, for most children with ADHD, the overall effects of these gene abnormalities appear small, suggesting that non-genetic factors also are important. Well, what might one of those be? We have, as I said, in my lab been exploring this phenomenon of overstimulation. And the general idea there is that prolonged exposure to rapid image change during this critical period of brain development that we've been talking about will precondition the mind to expect high levels of stimulation. And that will lead to inattention in later life. So basically put, you watch enough Baby Einstein day on the farm as an infant, and your brain starts to think, this is what life is like. This is the world I live in. It's that fast paced. And when you're six or four or seven and your parents take you to a farm, man, is it boring. Because there isn't a sheep popping out in front of me. There's no marionette going back and forth. Why do I have to walk from here to there? Why is everything so slow? This is not the kind of world that my mind is expecting to happen. Now, the first time we tested this, what we found was that the more television children watched before age three, the more likely they were to have attention problems at age seven. And we found something else that was interesting, because you might think that, well, what's happening here is they're watching television, and they're not getting other kinds of experiences that might be actually good for them. And in fact, that's true. What we found was that the more cognitive stimulation they had before age three, and we measured cognitive stimulation in this study by how often do you read to your child, how often do you take them to the museum, to the zoo, et cetera, the less likely they were to have attentional problems. So each hour of TV that they watched on a typical day before the age of three increased their chance of having attentional problems by 10%, meaning that a child who watched two hours of television a day before the age of three would be 20% more likely to have attentional problems at age seven compared to a child who watched none. And each hour of cognitive stimulation before the age of three resulted in a 20% decreased risk of having attentional problems. So if you will, these are two sides of the same coin. There are certain things that you can do early in your child's life, early in children's lives, that promote their ability to stay focused. And there are certain things that you can do early on that impede it. It's all about conditioning that early mind to the world that these children are inhabiting. Read to your child, present things in real time. They'll develop whatever innate capacity they have to focus on that overstimulate them with unnatural levels of stimulation, and they'll come to expect that and not be able to focus as well on things that happen in real time. Now, I have a question about um, starting your, so if you have your child start watching TV at age four and they don't have it before, is there any studies around you know, damage after the age of three? Yes, we've done lots of them and so have others. And, and what we're talking about here is purely based on, no, so 
that's a separate talk. But, but briefly, there are a lot of high quality programs for children, uh, actually really over the age of three, even two and a half, um, that, uh, that take place in slower pace and, and have been shown to be educational. In fact, we have a big research project right now doing just that, trying to modify the media diet of preschool children and looking at their cognitive and social outcomes. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, we've been talking about the pacing of the shows. And if, in fact, the overstimulation hypothesis is right, you might think that what children watch is important. So we followed up that study with a subsequent one. Now, I want to give you two examples of content. This is the Powerpuff Girls movie. Have any of you all seen that? Well, this is the opening sequence of the Powerpuff Girls movie. And again, you'll notice that there's um, a lot of kind of uh, loud rhythmic beats, a lot of very abrupt scene changes, a lot of violence too, but that's another. So you notice how it shifts scenes so frequently. This was um, the first movie that was actually rated PG for non-stop frenetic animated action. I'm not making that up. That's the back of the box. So that's one example of content. Now, I know all of you, in spite of the fact that many of you are too young to have watched this when it aired in real time, probably are familiar with Mr. Rogers. So I want to contrast the Powerpuff Girls movie with a, uh, a scene from Mr. Rogers. So here it is. Thanks. I brought my television neighbor to see what a restaurant was like. Oh, I'm so glad. Can I show you a table? Certainly. I'm awfully busy today. One of the waitresses is ill. I see. So I'm sort of doing double duty. How about this? This is fine. Thank Grand. you very much. Sit down and I'll be right back. All right. Now, when you come to a restaurant, usually somebody shows you what table you're supposed to sit at. And uh, one of the first things you do is to put your napkin either on your lap or up here. And then, well, this is the way a table is set. So Fred Rogers invented reality TV. He's not given credit for it. It's, it's not actually reality TV, right? It's, it's slower, certainly slower pace than reality is today. In fact, the waitress says, I'm awfully busy today, but she doesn't seem the least bit hurried. I mean, it, the, the pace of this show is, is, uh, is calming. It's soothing, and in fact, if anything, it's supernaturally slow, certainly by our current life standards and absolutely by the normal pacing of, of programs today. So when we followed up that study looking at what children watch and their risk of attentional problems later in life, we saw that educational programs like Mr. Rogers didn't increase their risk at all. And this also pertains to the, the question we had from the cyberspace. Um, entertainment programs like Powerpuff Girls, increased the risk by about 60%. And violent programs, which I didn't show you an example of because I don't like to show violent programming, um, uh, increased their chance by 110%. Violent programs actually are even more rapidly sequenced, typically, because there's a lot of fighting and action and back and forth. Yes, sir? Are there any gender differences on, on this? Yes. Uh, what, with respect to attention or with respect to violence? Well, like for boys, uh, uh, no, actually, we did not find a difference in, in, in gender with respect to this. So the interesting thing, when you talk about ADHD, and the H is the hyperactivity component, the A is the attentional component. And what we were measuring is really attention more than hyperactivity. So I say ADHD because that's the way most people think of it. Uh, and the difference between attentional problems in boys and girls is not different. There is no difference in prevalence. Boys are more likely to have the hyperactivity on top of the attention, but that's really a behavioral manifestation of Boys are more likely to be active, therefore they're more likely to be hyperactive when, when they're acting out. So um, there's a limit to where you can take observational research, because these, these were all observational. We did not take children and subject them to hours of watching uh, Baby Einstein. Um, for obvious reasons, uh, you can't do that, um, practical as well as ethical. So for the last couple of years in my lab, we've been building a mouse model of this, a mouse model of television, and you're watching. This is Mouse TV, um, and what you're hearing is audio from the cartoon, all right, that's enough of that. That's audio from the cartoon channel uh, being, just to be cute, they obviously don't, as far as I know, understand what it's saying. 
Um, and they're, they're put into these kind of TV lounges, and there is uh, photorhythmic uh, lights around the side. Here are the speakers, and the lights are around the side, so they're being sort of bombarded with uh, audio uh, and video, so to speak. Uh, we started about 10 days of life. They watched for about six hours a day for 42 days. This is the entire mouse childhood, and they spend it in front of a television, um, in front of the cartoon, the quote unquote car mouse cartoon channel. Uh, so it's a little bit extreme. It's their entire childhood, but it's, it's not out of the realm of possibilities for humans. Um, and, and, and this is where we started with this research. And after 10 days after we do this exposure, we assess their behavior. So we, we try to look at various aspects of mouse cognitive and, and emotional and social development. So the first thing, I'll just show you a few of the tests that we do. We look at what, activity and risk taking. And we do that using what's called the open field test. Now the way the open field test works is that you have a black box simulating an open field, and there's black electrical tape here. And when you put a mouse into any area, um, its natural tendency, right, it has competing instincts. Being in the middle of an open field is not a good place to be as a mouse, right? They have very few friends in the natural world, and their instinct is to stay, to hover around the edges of a field where they're, where they're safe. But they have a competing instinct to forage, right, to explore their environment because they have to do that in order to get food. So a normal mouse will spend most of its time around the perimeter and venture occasionally into the open field. And we exploit the fact that we have a white mouse on a deliberately black background and we have a computer tracker above that's able to track the movement of, you guys are, I'm sure this is the, probably the most interesting part of the talk here, this kind of computer tracking device, which, um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so here's, here's the normal pathway. You can see here that this mouse spends most of its time around the perimeter and very little time in the open field. Now look at this mouse, you'll notice two things. One, it's all over the place. Uh, it spends a lot of time in the middle of the open field and it also, is um, much more active. It, in general, moves around much more than the quote-unquote normal mouse. So you would describe this mouse as both hyperactive and risk-taking, or non-risk-averse, because it's venturing into the middle a lot, which um, are behaviors we actually see in children with attentional problems. In some cases, adaptive, mostly maladaptive. And what we found here, if you look at the time spent in the center, these are our control mice raised under normal circumstances, how many seconds they spend in the middle of the, of the field. Compared to our overstimulated mice, dramatic difference, with the overstimulated mice taking a lot more risks. And then this measures entries into the center. How often do they actually poke in there? And again, you'll see that the overstimulated mice are much, more, uh, risk of, much less risk averse. The next thing I'll show you is what's called the Novel Object Recognition Test, and this tests short-term memory. And the way this works is you put a mouse into a chamber, again, a black chamber. I apologize, the video of this is a little, I don't know, it's a little wonky, but you get the general, like, this pixelated thing here is a mouse, and these are objects. Um, so you put a mouse into a chamber with two objects, and you let the mouse spend 10 minutes exploring the objects, and that's what it does. It goes around and explores them. And then you take the mouse out, you take out one of the objects, and you put in a new object, a quote unquote novel object, and you put the mouse back in. Now, if the mouse remembers the object that it saw that was in there before, it will and should spend more time exploring the novel object, right? I already, it already knows what this is, what's this new thing, might it possibly feed me? So that's the general way it works, and as you can see, you can measure that using the same cool computer tracking pro <laughs> program that we have, um, how much time they spend. And you'll see here that this mouse, in fact, does spend more time on the novel object, less time on the familiar object, whereas this one spends about the same amount of time on both. And what we found in our experiments is that the control mouse, the normal mouse, as we would predict, spends 70% of its time on the novel object and 30% on the familiar, right? So it cognitively is aware of the fact that this is new and that's not. But look what our overstimulated mice do. 50-50, exactly the same amount. So it's either as if they cannot recognize a novel object, they have very impaired short-term memory, or they don't care uh, at all. But all I can say is that they are not behaving like normal mice do. Uh, and, you know, is that a problem for a mouse? I don't know. 
uh, I think in theory, there's some advantage to being able to have short-term memory, even if you're a mouse, certainly if you're a human. And the final test I'll show you is what's called the Barnes maze. And this tests learning. And the way this works is that you put the mouse on this demi-sphere like this, and there are a bunch of escape holes here. And all of them are blocked but one, the one that you see right here. And the mouse is put on there on four successive days and it will explore trying to get out because, again, there's a bright light on this and mice don't like to be exposed. Um, and you time how long it takes them. So you see here, here's a mouse on there. Uh, and it's, it, it, uh, it, it, watch what it does here, and it goes right for the escape hole and it's, it's gone. So you notice that this mouse didn't even explore other holes. Uh, it knew where the escape hole was. And you, you time that and you see how long it takes them to escape on the fifth day, well, on each day, but the fifth day is, quote unquote, the day that they are formally tested to see how well they've learned. Now, here's what we found on successive days. In black, you see the control mice. In purple, you see the overstimulated mice. And this is how long it takes them to escape. On day one, very interesting, the overstimulated mice escape sooner than the control mice. They find the escape hole faster. But look at what happens by day four when uh, they are supposedly having learned this behavior, the exact opposite, things reverse. The overstimulated mice um, take longer to escape than the control mice. Now, why might that be? Well, you might think, well, geez, these mice do much better at the beginning. Well, this is a reflection of what we just showed you before, that these mice are, uh, that these mice rather, are hyperkinetic and less risk averse. So you put them on there and they start running around and they escape <laughs> sooner than these mice. But over time, they don't learn as well. So even though that, that hyperkinesis serves them well on day one, uh, over time, they don't, they don't function as well as, as our control mice. So I focus on sort of the, 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 the potential downside in both mice and children of a uh, overstimulating, inappropriately stimulating environment. I want to shift gears here and talk about the flip side of that. So what are alternatives? And, and this is a building block study we did here in Seattle Children's um, in a clinic in, in Seattle uh, a few years ago. This was, an ex this was an experiment in humans, so I told you we can't randomize children to be overstimulated, but we can randomize them to have appropriate uh, cognitive stimulation. So we took low-income kids, uh, 200 of them, between 18 and 24 months, and half of them got blocks. These were mega blocks, like Duplos, big Legos. Half of them got them at the beginning, and half of them got them at the end. And these were low-income children. I, I don't know if I said that or not. And their parents got what we call blocktivity. So each month, their parents got a newsletter that suggested ways to play with their kids with blocks. Simple things. Count the blocks, stack the blocks, sort the blocks by color. Uh, there we go. And um, Here's what you see. How many kids played with blocks in a typical day? In the block group, about 60% of kids played with blocks on a typical day, compared to our control group, where about 13% of block kids played with blocks on a typical day. They played with them for about 20 minutes a day, one and a half episodes per day, and about 65% of the time was with a parent, 35% of the time on their own. And we measured at six months their language percentile, so how, well, how many words did they know? And what you can see here is the control group scored in the 42nd percentile. So below average, but unfortunately not uncommon for low-income children anywhere in the world, but, but certainly in the United States. But the block group scored in the 56th percentile, slightly above average. And this difference was not only statistically significant, but clinically significant, a 14 percentage point difference by promoting uh, parent-child interaction around a tactile toy early in this critical period of brain development. So why might that be? Why might it be that blocks promote development and television uh, undermines it? We spoke a little bit about the possibility of attentional problems, but there's also something missing potentially when TVs are on, something that children are not getting. So. Uh, one theory we had was that they're, they're, the television is displacing real human interaction. And the way we measured this was using this LENA system. This is a 
more cool technology for you guys. A digital language processor. It's a tiny little device that the child wears in a vest. It records everything that the child, uh, that is audible at the child's chest. Everything the child says, everything that they would hear. Um, oops. And then we have a software program that automatically analyzes the data. It counts adult words, both male and female, child vocalizations, conversational turns, so how often does an adult talk to a child, and it also uh, counts television time. And what we did in this analysis is something called conditional regression. So each child served as their own control. We compared the number of words that they heard and said when they could hear a TV versus when they could not. Right? So sometimes the television was on, sometimes it wasn't. How many words were they hearing um, when it was on? How many words were, human words were they hearing when it was off? Oops. So what did we find? Well, each, each hour of TV that a child could hear resulted in them hearing 656 fewer adult female words and about 200 fewer adult male words. Now, how many words does the typical adult female say in one hour? About 700. So what you see here is about an 80 and 90% reduction. That's how, many, that's how much is being pushed out. So when she would be saying, when this baby would be hearing 700 from a typical adult female, they're only hearing about 44. Now how many words does a typical adult male say in an hour? More or less than women? <laughs> what? Less, I hear men saying less. Do women agree that it's less? Yeah, so it's interesting. They say the exact same number of words. Um, that's not my research. That's research that others have done. They're within 10 words of each other, not statistically significant. So men and women say, speak the same amount. doesn't mean they listen to each other, but they actually say the same number of words. The reason you're seeing a smaller reduction in male vocalizations to the infant is not because men speak less, but they speak less to babies. So uh, this reduction may reflect the same percentage reduction as that one uh, in terms of what is being spoken to the baby. But, they, but men and women talk the same amount. So that argument is now settled. Those of you who've raged for years with your, with your significant others and parents, you can just put it to bed. OK, uh, some of the more recent stuff we're doing, looking at what we call neuroendocrine effects, so uh, uh, hormonal effects to, uh, to early viewing. And this is an experiment that we just completed where we brought infants into the lab. These are young babies, 9 to 12 months. And they're randomized to either watch TV for half an hour or play with blocks. These are the blocks we used in the prior studies. And we collect salivary cortisol from them. Um, so we, we stick little blotters in their mouths, which is great for infants because they drool so much. It's very easy to collect. And, and, and we measure their salivary cortisol. And salivary cortisol uh, lags about 20 minutes behind serum cortisol. So it, it measures basically this, the cortisol that was present in their blood 20 minutes before. Now most of you know and think of cortisol as a stress hormone, and it is, in fact, a stress hormone. But the interesting thing about it, it's more complicated than that. There's really um, what we call an inverted U when it comes to cortisol and learning or performance. So if you have very, very low cortisol levels, you don't perform very, very well. If you have very, very high cortisol levels, you don't perform well. A certain amount of arousal is not stress, it's engagement. So uh, optimal test performance is not achieved when you're super stressed, but it's not achieved when you're totally laid back either. Uh, all of you in this room have taken hundreds of tests, and you may have noted that, or, or you may not have noted it, but there's a right amount of stress to feel in order to do your best work. And what we found was, and I'll just sort of cut to the chase with these numbers, is that there were significant differences um, with the kids in the block group having slightly higher cortisol levels uh, than the kids in the DVD group. In fact, these effect sizes, for those of you that are uh, statistically savvy, are a measure of standard deviations. That's what this measures. So about 10 minutes into the activity, the kids who were playing with blocks had about uh, 0.68 standard deviations, higher cortisol level than the kids watching the DVD, and 20 minutes into the activity, a full standard deviation higher, which is a significant and clinically significant increase. Now, the important point here is that we know that block play is good for children. We know it just because we kind of know it. It's like apple pie, but we know it because, as I showed you, at least in our research, it promotes 
healthy brain development. So whatever cortisol response we're seeing in babies in response to that activity, we can think of as being healthy. And it's significantly higher than what we're seeing in the baby DVD viewing. Yes? Was this block study with the parent then, or was there just blocks? Excellent question. So we actually tried to simulate a naturalistic environment. So what we did is we brought the parents in, and we randomized them, and then we told them, uh, play with blocks with your child like you would at home, or watch TV with your child as you would at home. Some, most parents with the blocks did play with their children. Um, most parents with a DVD didn't engage their child at all, which is sort of akin to what they would do uh, at home. So that's those data. And I hope in the brief time we spent together, I've managed to convince you that early childhood for children and for mice is critical to their development. And we really need more real-time play, less fast-paced media. And I want to emphasize fast-paced media because some of you may ask about that, and that's research we're doing now, fast as opposed to slow pace for young children. Because if you change the beginning, you change the whole story. And what we do for children early on really is about changing the whole story. So thank you very much. I want to acknowledge my collaborators and research assistants, my children who are my inspiration, my funders, and these are some of the people in my lab. And I would be happy to take questions with whatever time we have left. Yes? Um. Uh, the NAEYC and the Fred Rogers yes. uh, group put out their joint position statement on screen time and early uh, childhood. And they, I was actually pretty refreshed by that because they started treating different kinds of screens differently yes. and understanding that the context for usage for different types of activities is going to vary, vary across screens. So screen is not a screen is not a screen. Um, how do you find that that impacts the kind of research you're doing or the, the context of the findings that you have? That's a great question. So you're absolutely right. And in fact, um, I mean, the sort of central pretense of my book is that for many years, and this is prior to the new media, this is based in old media, uh, people used to think of television in those days monolithically, like it was a single entity, and ask the question, you know, is TV good or bad? It's a stupid question. It's framed incorrectly because Television isn't one thing. There's good TV and there's bad TV. And the content is more important than the medium itself. Um, and there's touch screen, there's co-viewing, there's... All of those other dimensions. And that's been writ large now with the newer technologies that are interactive. So the, the principles um, that are articulated are, are absolutely true. So um, still, so you can take a, an iPod, I'm sorry, an iPad, if I'm allowed to say that here, and treat it just like a, a regular screen, right? You can watch... Powerpuff Girls on it, uh, in which case it's essentially a television. Um, but you can do all kinds of other things on it uh, using its interactivity um, that make it fundamentally different. Uh, so the, the, the long answer to your question is that it absolutely informs my research. The, the, the follow-up to this baby DVD study that we're doing is we're bringing babies in and having them interact with an iPad versus the blocks. And my hypothesis there is that we won't see a difference because it is interactive. Um, uh, it, it is tactile. It's all of the things that a traditional TV is not. Now, the flip side of all that is I have to point out that the upside of these also is a potential downside. So the interactivity, um, the fact that, you, that a baby touches something or child, even a human and gets a reaction um, is, is great. And at, at the at the neuronal level, what you're getting is, is a release of dopamine. You're getting a feedback. You're getting positive feedback, um, which leads to engagement, which is very good, particularly if you're trying to make something uh, educational, right? The fact that they're, they're, they'll focus on the screen. But that dopamine feedback loop, uh, just like any other, um, has the potential to become, frankly, addictive. So when parents say they can't pry their child away from an iPad, um, in the extreme, it becomes true that they really are like, I mean, think of the, the Skinner box with the operant conditioning. It's the same phenomenon uh, at play, that the child's looking at the screen for something to touch to get that positive feed, that reinforcement, whatever it is, points, ribbons, other objects uh, that they're trying to acquire, even in the service of a, of, a, of, a, of a good thing. So I am bullish on the positive aspects of interactive technologies for infants. And even though I'm on the executive committee 
of the American Academy of Pediatrics that issues screen time recommendations that says no screen time before age two, I think it's misguided because I don't think all screens are the same as you said. But in the extreme, it, at any, it, you know, I often say that, you know, carrots are a healthy food to be sure. But if they comprise your entire diet, they no longer are healthy. So everything has to be in proportion, healthy proportion. Yes, sir. Uh, early on the slide, you stressed the difference uh, between the, the content yes. versus the, the rate of change of imagery yes. on the very young children. Yes. So I was just wondering if, if the watching TV in that sense would be any different uh, compared to kids exposed to change of scenery when they ride car with children, with their parents. Let's say the parent take the child every day, one hour each way. Uh, so yeah. they're seeing, seeing change of scenery. Yeah. Would that, would that constitute the same effect on brain it, So it, it actually doesn't. And it's interesting you say that because it isn't. So it's, it's, it's it, what I showed you, um, the scene changes I showed you were dramatic and supernatural. They command attention in a way that a smooth ride does not, right? And in fact, um, and you, if you spend time in, in the car with children, they're typically not looking out the window. They're, you know, they're not distracted. Sometimes you want them to look out the window so, they're, so they'll, they'll, you know, they'll focus on the scenery instead of, instead of asking you how soon we're gonna get there. Um, so no, it doesn't play out the same way. Um, I, I've been asked, it's funny, I've been asked that question before. Um, but but the, 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 the larger context here is that, you know, uh, our brains evolved over millennia and they evolved to process events um, in real time. And of course, in the real world, everything takes place in real time. It wasn't until the advent of media that it became possible for things to happen at a supernatural pace. Um, but our brains haven't evolved in the time that that's happened. Now, you might rightly say that, well, the car moving is also an unnatural pace, and it is, but the effects aren't, we don't see it in, in car driving. Yes? Um, my question is, is there a preference, like in the children, between like an overstimulated television show and a one that isn't? Do, they, do we, is it kind of hardwired that we prefer that kind of thing, and we have to, it's kind of like eating your vegetables. <laughs> That's not what we want to do, we want to eat sugar. Um, is, that, is that what's happening, or is it mostly like parents wanting to kind of have the table to eat? So it's, so it's, it's a couple things. So when we start with infants, as, um, as, I, I, as I pointed out, what's getting them to watch the screen is not, you can't put content that's interesting to them on there. They're much more interested in the real world than they are the screen. So it is that rapid image change through the orienting response that gets them to stay. There's no natural predilection to, to fast-paced things at all. Um, but, but the paradox is that you can condition the mind to expect that. Now, you know, we've been talking a lot about infants, but all of us now have come to expect very, very high levels of stimulation. And it's not just uh, programming for infants that's very rapidly sequenced. Just compare the typical program you might watch, the typical movie you might watch today, to one from 20 years ago, 10 years ago, certainly 40 years ago, where there would be a single narrative that was sort of followed all the way through. Now there are typically several narratives coming from different directions. You switch scenes back and forth many, many different times. Um, you know, that's, that's playing to a generally shortened attention span. It's true for the news, it's true for everything. All, I mean, frankly, it's, it's true for reading. Um, we've, we've shortened our attention spans and therefore gotten sort of in a vicious cycle where we provide ourselves with little, smaller and smaller tidbits of, of, of stuff to process. So, um, what are the typical window for, uh, for us to facilitate a good brain development? We read up to five years, the brain develops for a kid and the window we should use for a healthy development. So what is the actual window we have to do a good brain development for the kids? Well, it's, it's so I, I, my research focuses on birth to five because that's where you know, a lot of the action is. Um, but it's not, it doesn't stop there. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't want you to leave here saying, you know, as long as I provide good stimulation for my child at the age of five, then I can just you know, <laughs> mail it in from then on. Um, the, the early part, what you're seeing is, is structural, right? That brain growth, those synaptic connections. That's why I focus my research there because, you know, uh, there's a lot of action there. There's a lot of structural changes, but it's 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 true, you know, across all of the ages. I mean, there's still brain growth, as you saw, up until age 20. Um, so one of the things I've noticed when I travel is that the, the TV for kids can be quite different from yes. country to country. So do you have any senses to 
how that plays out with your studies. So, so I gave I gave a, a talk in uh, in Stockholm a couple years ago, and um, the the questions from the audience were like, "Well, what parent would ever let their baby watch television? Like, what are you guys doing in America?" Um, but that's unusual. I mean, the 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 the, uh, <laughs> the Scandinavian cultures are unusual in their in their obsession with early childhood and parenting in a way that I I think is actually healthy. M many many, in fact, most countries now um, have adapted. They, I mean, have adopted U.S. programming for older people, and they're adopting it for younger people as well. So, but I would argue that. So I'm not. I'm not talking about these extreme, you know, societies where you know kids are not watching. TV. Yeah, I would argue that even traveling to Canada, actually, yeah. the, the TV channels for kids are quite different in the content they show than the one in the U.S. For so so Canada does have some interesting differences. One, the biggest one of which is that they they regulate children's programs in a way that we don't. So you're right. They have restrictions on advertising, which the United States will never have. Uh, advertising to children. They have restriction on the kinds of programs. They have different rating systems. All of that is true. But of course, you can get the Dish Network in Canada and get and get and 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 many many people do. Um, it's very difficult to do. Uh, I, 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 so if the question was. Do we see, based on observational data, differences that might explain, you know, no, but those studies are so messy because it's never one thing. I mean, the fantasy of a researcher is that we have two cultures that are exactly the same, except one watches television and one does not, and it never works that way, with, with, with one very famous exception, but that's a whole separate topic. You haven't asked a question yet, right? No, okay, yes. So it seemed like a lot of your work, especially comparing the blocks or even the cognitive stimulation versus TV, that the main distinction was the level of interaction the child was having with the parent. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking at TV specifically, but wouldn't you have similar findings? Like if you had a very a really engaged parent who interacted with their child while watching TV, wouldn't it kind of take away from those effects as like in a child playing with blocks by themselves? And wouldn't that then flip it? Is TV really the inherent it's thing? A, it's, there? A great, it's a great question. So, so uh, in answer to her question, what we asked parents to do was to, watch, to, to uh, interact with your child as you would. And, and, and parents did, especially because they were you know, being observed. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and they didn't do what they would do at home, perhaps, which is say, like, you know, okay, like, you, know, uh, you sit here, I'm going to go in the other room. And, uh, so they, they did, and we, we tracked that, and they did try to engage. Um, the, the short answer is you can't really engage your child because they are focused on the screen, not on anything you say because of the orienting reflex we said. But yes, I mean, ultimately, I would say it's mediated through interactivity, and that's, that's part of what we did, the, the, the Lena study, the language study to show is that they are missing out on talk, on engagement, on entertainment, I mean, on parental interaction when a screen is on. Incidentally, not to malign any parents here who do that. We all do that. I mean, it, it, television is incredibly distracting. I don't know if you've ever been, you know, at a bar or restaurant and there's a TV there that's, you know, showing, you know, bowling. I mean, you couldn't be less interested in it. And yet you no offense to any bowlers. I couldn't be less interested in it. But but you, your eyes will wander up to the screen incessantly to see what's going on. Typically when there's a sound, right? It's again, it's the orientation. Something's changed for what is it? What's going on up there now? Um, so so yes. Again, back to, to your question, the different nature of those interactive apps, some of the really good ones, is that they actually could force parental interaction because they create a platform where, um, so some of the work we do now is around uh, what's called dyadic attention. And how does that work? Well, uh, joint attention is what's called, but dyadic and triadic. So um, very early on, uh, in the first early months of life, first four months of life, parents will call a child's attention to something. You'll say, look at that, what is that? And by four months, the child will be able to, to look at that. And, when they, and by six months, they'll look at it and then look to you for a reaction. What is that? So you grab their attention to it. They look at it. They look to you to say, tell me about it. Right? That's, the early, that's, that's sort of early learning writ large. By nine months, the child will call their, your attention to something, point to something, make a sound. You will look at it. Then you'll look at each other. And, and have some kind of an interaction. So that natural kind of interactive joint attention is how babies learn. It's what's interrupted by TV when a child is staring at this, not calling your attention. If you try to call their attention, they're ignoring you. Uh, but it's, it's something that, in theory, a well-designed app could promote precisely because the baby will look at it, look to you, 
right? Maybe you need to do something. So it, it, it could promote parent-child interactions. Um, hasn't been tested. It, it's certainly something that, that I believe would be true and that we plan to test with a little help. Yes? I guess, yeah. Um, so I heard, I think, something, an interview you had a few years ago on NPR. And, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things I came up with was if you have siblings. So yeah. got a, I got a four-year-old and a one-year-old. The four-year-old was growing up. He was off. Yeah. Now that he's watching programs, yeah. the one-year-old is looking at the TV. Yes. What are some, some of the research you've done yeah. to see that impact and then some advice you have? Well, so the, the best advice I have, you know, frankly, for that, so that is a challenge. I mean, that's, that's you know, I've, I have two kids. They're older than that now, but I've been there, done that. Um, that, is, that is a challenge. And I'm not going to give you the simple advice, which is the, the, the simplest advice, which is, you know, don't have the one-year-old watch because that's impractical. So I, I think that um, be selective about the content that your four-year-old watches. Check the pacing of it. Um, and, and the good news for four-year-olds is that there's tons of really good programming, and, and much of it happens in, 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 in a very good uh, pacing. In fact, the follow-up study I showed you showed that if you have slow-paced, normal-paced uh, programs, there is no increased risk. So I don't think you need to worry about your one-year-old. They won't find those programs very interesting, I suspect, uh, which is fine. So you know, have blocks down for them to, to you know, play with or you know, have a book that you read to them. They won't be very distracted by the show, typically. If you put a very fast-paced pro program on, they might be. And that's typically all kids are different. Y uh, y you've already asked. I'll come back to you. OK, go ahead. Yeah. Have you already asked? You can't no. keep you all. So you all look alike. Too. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you said that um, obviously a child's mind uh, is clearly developing itself structurally towards this environment. Yeah. I think it's, it seems like a big part of the healthiness of block play or that sort of cognitive simulation would be the experiential learning yes. aspects. Like they're learning about the world, they're learning about yes. the environment, how things work. Whereas a TV doesn't provide that. But even an interactive experience might, in the sort of abstract, uh, say on a yes. tablet or whatever, might not actually you know, have anything to teach about the world. It might just have something to teach about an abstract system, yes. like a game or something. Do you? see there being any sort of theorizing around like those differences? Yes, it's a great question. It's funny. I mean, I, yes. So you anticipated if I'd, if I'd spent more time a answering this woman's question, I would have eventually gotten there. So, so yes, in the extreme, and I, and I alluded to it by saying, you know, in the extreme. So there, there are two ways that media exert their effects. One is for what I call the direct effects, which is content driven. We sort of talked about that. The other is the indirect effects, which is through displacement. So there are only so many hours in the day. Every hour spent with a TV, or for that matter, with an iPad, comes at the expense of something else. What would you have been doing during that time? And while I think that there's ample reason to believe that this, the interactive experience of the iPad not only significantly mitigates or even eliminates this, but has upsides that I alluded to, I would hate. It, it doesn't perfectly simulate the real world. And I would certainly not like to live in a world where children played with virtual Legos instead of Legos. You know, there's a Lego app. And I would hate for parents to say, well, there's no need to buy Legos. They could just do Legos on the iPad because it's not the same thing. It's two-dimensional, not three. At least now, I'm sure that you guys will soon have three-dimensional uh, uh, graphics for kids to play with and for adults to play with. Um, but even that will then lack the tactile component. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's still a virtual world. But, um, but it's here to stay. It's not going away. We have to find a way to make it, on balance, a positive experience. And I, and I think we can. I, I don't think it's, it's a done deal. Um, it might be a little on the edge of what your research is, but you know, if you put a child in a car seat and then pop them in front of a TV for a number of hours, um, what's their ability to discriminate foreground versus background, thinking more along the lines of autism or uh. autistic experiences? Meaning, so you're saying, I just want to make... Is there a loss there? So yeah. you know, if they have attention deficit, yeah. could, it, could you sort of extrapolate that into this other realm? Uh, you know, autism? autism? So autism. yeah, so many people ask me about whether there's an autism, um, an early TV link. And, and um, I can tell you where we are with that. I started to talk about joint attention. If you bring um, six-month-olds with autism into our lab, uh, and look at joint attention, they, they don't function like normal kids. They already are not, so you know, we, we all think of autism having sort of lacking these social cues. At six to nine months, they're already not, they're not having the dyadic attention that 
quote unquote normal kids do. There's also some research that shows that promoting that dyadic attention in early, in early childhood uh, can mitigate the effects of autism later on. So although no one has done the study to link media with autism, we are now looking at, at, at or we're planning on looking at just that, at whether or not um, early exposure diminishes joint attention. We focus on learning, but um, does that also lead to autism? Uh, you know, that's, that is pushing the envelope, and I don't want anyone to take away from this that Dr. Christakis said that TV leads to autism, because I'm not saying that. But um, it's a fascinating idea, and we're just starting to explore. Set more or less sensory deprivation, so the kids... Right. There's that component to it, too, that they're not... That's right. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the, you know, some, I told you that the typical child watch, preschool child watches about four hours. That's the average, right? And you have outliers. So, you know, and, and when we collect these data, they're kids, as you would predict, if four is the average, they're kids that are watching six, eight, ten hours. 25% of American households have the television on all the time, even when no one is watching. That's their report. You know, they say we have it on all the time, even when no one's watching. Um, so there are a lot of kids that are getting that constant barrage of, of unnatural stimulation. Sorry, but thank you so much for coming. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming.